I think, of course, in such an event, when you talk about metabolic diseases, it, it's a must to talk about metabolomics itself. And uh, in my talk, I'm going to shift the gears a bit and move on from this kind of genomics heavy focus that you had for these couple of days to more uh, metabolomics focus. Um, my talk will be long, so stay strong. And thank you for endurance so far that you stayed so long. Uh, what I will try to do is kind of give a brief overview about the whole process. So without further ado, um, what I want for you to keep in mind when we talk about metabolomics and, and especially about liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry based metabolomics, that every single detail matters. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should control them. Uh, at least we need to be aware of them. So if you can't control the details that you're working on, at least be aware, be aware of what influence it can, might have on your results and if and how you can account for that. So a bit about myself, my background. So uh, I'm uh, born and raised in Latvia. I did my bachelor and master's here, uh, focusing on chemistry. And I moved to Vienna, Austria for my PhD, where I started to work on, on uh, uh, metabolomics developing methods. Uh, after my PhD, I moved to the company where I worked as a scientist to develop a metabolomics-based kit. So also for LCMS-based kits. Uh, after my time there, um, I moved to the research institute where I was a heading a metabolomics facility. So my task was to set up all the workflows for metabolic analysis. And since almost two years I'm back in Riga, I'm joining Riga Technical University as a Marie Curie fellow um, and also a group leader here. So what I have done uh, in my lifetime since I'm working with metabolomics, which is uh, more than 10 years, I counted yesterday, so I believe I have developed more than 20 methods, uh, mainly liquid chromatography, mass, mass spectrometry based methods, and I have analyzed more than 15,000 samples. And samples include cells, tissue, plasma, some weird stuff like um, uh, some enzymatic reaction mixtures and things like that. So I would say that I have seen fair share of metabolomics. Uh, I have worked with that. Um, I don't claim that I'm the biggest expert there, but at least I can share some of my knowledge uh, with you today. Uh, also, kind of housekeeping uh, things, uh, literature that I use to prepare this presentation is available for all of you. I have put it on uh, Google Drive. Uh, if you scan this code or if the slides will be available afterwards, you, you can access all the publications that I used so that you don't need to frantically write down uh, all the citations if you see in the slides. So as I said, in this, um, in this talk, uh, I will try to really cover the the biggest part of, of, uh, of metabolomics workflow and really starting from, from uh, a bit of talking about sampling and then really going to statistical analysis and a bit of a pathway analysis. Um, I will make some breaks in between. So if there's any questions that, uh, that you might have that you can have time to answer it. And so the first thing is, oh yeah, and, and also because it's kind of bioinformatic session, I will also focus um, uh, mainly, like most of, half of my talk about, about data processing and annotation that I used in, in metabolomics. So first, uh, just a general introduction. So what is metabolomics? Um, when I talk about metabolomics, what I like to do is this kind of analogy of biological information, how the information flows in every uh, living organism. So we all know about genes and genomics, and you most probably better than I do. So basically genes shows what can happen, right? And we know there's roughly 30,000 genes. We can sequence them. And again, again, this information from genomics then is called, uh, transferred to transcriptomics. And this says us what appears to happen. So what are the changes that which genes are activated, which genes are expressed, so what appears to happen? And when we move from uh, genes to transcriptomes, so this number kind of increases quite significantly. And of course, a lot of uh, transcripts then end in, in proteins, so we, we kind of translated or end up with proteomics or proteins. And in, in humans it has been established, uh, estimated to have at least half a million proteins. And so these proteins then are involved in uh, various chemical reactions as enzymes. And the, these chemical reactions are driven by metabolites. So this is metabolomics. This actually shows us what has happened and is happening at the moment. Um, of course, there is also Metabolite serves as, as kind of a building blocks for these molecules. So it's not only that information gets transferred, but also metabolites are uh, fed back or used as building blocks to build up DNA, RNA, amino acids for proteins. But what also happens is that what we've seen in recent years in literature 
that metabolites can actively influence those processes. You know, there's like epigenetics. We talk about metabolite influence on gene expression levels uh, or cross-translational modifications, proteomics. So metabolomics is not just building blocks and not just kind of reactions that happen in the background. It actually can have function and uh, an active function in, in cellular function in cellular um, uh, in cellular life in a way. Uh, and all these things that I talked before, so these DNA, RNA proteins, um, and metabolic reactions, it happens inside the cell. Uh, but of course, uh, metabolites are also transported from outside into the cell or exported from the cell outside. And everything that happens outside the cell is influenced by environment, starting from nutrition, pollution, drugs, viruses, lifestyle, microbiome, um, and all of these things. So if when we measure metabolites uh, or metabolomics, we can get the kind of quantitative phenotyping. So we get all this sum of downstream products of genes and genomics and environment. So it's really an exciting field. It gives a lot of information. It's also sometimes really uh, convoluting and, and it takes a lot of effort to, to really distinguish the different parts of uh, metabolomics and where these changes come from. What is also a valid question for us to ask, what is metabolite? Uh, and as I mentioned before, so metabolite is a chemical compound that takes part in, 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 uh, in a metabolism. And for me as a chemist, you know, it's all about compounds. So there's a structure. For those ones who know what it is, it's great. If you don't know, this is glutamic acid. Uh, and as a chemist, right, every compound has uh, some formula, it has a mass. And clever people also have uh, gave those have given those metabolites uh, um, ID numbers. In this case, for instance, for glutamic acid, here's a human metabolite database ID number for this compound. So what we know then is, of course, that this uh, metabolite, in this case, glutamic acid, is involved in reactions, so it can transform to glutamine in a living organisms. We know what is the enzyme that facilitate this uh, reaction, and we know what are the genes that express this enzyme. So this is kind of metabolite. It, it's the part of metabolism, uh, either the product uh, or, or uh, intermediate in between. And in our body or every living organism, there's a thousands and thousands of these mo uh, molecules and there's a thousands and thousands of reactions. And what metabolomics tries to do is to really experimentally assess and measure all of those metabolites in biological system. Uh, so to really have a comprehensive understanding how all this network and pathway, how it works, and what changes upon uh, different conditions, let's say, in case of some disease. And so the classical kind of canonical uh, description of metabolite, it is a small molecule, usually below 100 daltons, uh, that is found within the biological system, which is intermediate product of metabolism. There are several key benefits to study uh, metabolome. Um, first of all, it really provides the closest link to phenotype. So if we can characterize the metabolome, we can really uh, kind of characterize or, or have a, a quantitative description of uh, biological system. Metabolism is highly conserved across biology, meaning that if we study something in cell cultures, um, this will also apply to the humans, or if you study some, something in some model uh, animals, this will also be most probably be preserved also in humans. Uh, again, for me as an alcohol chemist, which is also really uh, valid point is that analytical approaches are transferable across different biological systems. What that means is that if I have a method to assess metabolites in uh, mouse plasma, I can use the same method to assess metabolites in human liver samples because metabolites will be the same, more or less, you know, because a previous point is metabolism is highly conserved. And also the knowledge is kind of uh, transferable. Uh, also, what is not uh, bad is that metabolomics is highly high throughput uh, and relatively low cost. So it allows to do large scale studies. It allows to do a screening for a large number of samples. And because of these kind of advantages and, and, and importance, metabolomics has been used for various other, uh, applications, starting from understanding disease mechanisms, biomarker discovery, as well as in in identify, identifying targets for drug development, and also most recently microbiome host interactions. Uh, there are several challenges when we talk about metabolite analysis compared to gene analysis or even protein analysis. So first of all, uh, the number of metabolites is currently quite unknown in, given, uh, in, in a given organism. So if you go to the human metabolite database and we search for all possible metabolites, 
we will get around 100,000 entries. If we look at the metabolites that are detected in blood, it will be around 20, uh, 25,000. And then if we search for those ones that are endogenous, kind of the ones that are produced by body, that are not drugs, things like that, we can end up around with 24,000. However, if we look which metabolites are actually quantified, so that are measured and we have quantitative values, we end up with uh, a bit less than 3,000. Uh, another challenge is that uh, metabolites present a very wide class of, of molecules. It really goes from polar molecules like carbohydrates and organic acids to really hydrophob uh, hydrophobic molecules like lipids. Uh, so this, there's a lot of variety in chemical classes, a lot of variety in, in uh, possible structures. And also there's a huge uh, dispersity between the concentrations. There are some metabolites that have millimolar concentrations. If we think about, uh, let's say, glucose in blood, and there are some that are nanomolar, uh, nanomolar concentrations. So this possesses kind of um, instrumental challenge because no single instrument can detect all the metabolites and cannot measure uh, all metabolites within one method. Uh, currently, there are kind of two main strategies how to, how to measure metabolites. Uh, one was using nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, NMR, and another one is mass spectrometry, uh, either uh, combined with gas chromatography or liquid chromatography. All of those techniques have the advantages and disadvantages, but in recent years, uh, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry has been, or it has emerged as the most widely used technique because it can provide the widest metabolic coverage as well as really good um, sensitivity of, of instrumentation. Um, I later on my slides also will talk more about LCMS and explain how it actually works. There are several approaches how uh, uh, metabolomics can be done. And one is so-called untargeted analysis, uh, which uh, canonically has been described as hypothesis generating. So we go without any hypothesis about which metabolites are changed, which pathways are changed, and we try to catch as much as, as we can with our analytical technique of choice. Then we might uh, identify some metabolite change. For instance, in TCA cycle, one of the metabolites are significantly changed. And the next step would be to perform target analysis or what has also been uh, described as pathway analysis. So we kind of zoom in on this one particular cycle. We just uh, count what are the metabolites here. And then we do analysis and confirm that really TCA cycle in particular study is changed. So this is kind of the, uh, we are testing our hypothesis. So we generate a hypothesis here and we're testing it here. However, in recent years with the advanced advancements of uh, technologies, what has emerged is also really promising technique is so-called targeted profiling. So which means we, we know what we measure, uh, which, which are the metabolites we look at, but there are a lot of them. So we can cover really huge landscape of uh, metabolic network. And what this allows us is to either generate hypothesis. If you don't have any hypothesis, we will see that in some parts, some metabolites will pop up. Or if we have hypothesis we, using the same method, we can test it. So for, uh, for example, with, uh, with the TCA cycle, you know, if let's say we've seen this one metabolite that is kind of uh, uh, changed significantly, we can look if there's other metabolites around that already in existing data, already with the with target profiling. What is also really uh, interesting uh, technique that gives kind of functional readout. So if we measure uh, this fixed state, we just see kind of metabolite levels, but we don't really see the, the, the speed or the rate of, of uh, metabolism. Uh, and meta metabol metabolism is really a dynamic process. So also the speed gives a lot of information. Uh, and to kind of get information about the rate or, or speed, uh, there's isotope tracing or so-called flux analysis. So what it means that we introduce a, a, a tracer, which is a stable isotope labeled metabolite, usually C13 labeled metabolite in our biological system. And then at certain points, we would sample it. And so what happens that is then we start to understand how these metabolites move through the system, how they get metabolized, and if there's differences in the rate of, of this metabolism. So not only the, not only the levels matter, but also the speed of, of metabolism matters. Um, so to sum up the metabolism approaches, so we have targeted, untargeted, and target profiling. For untargeted sample preparation is simple. So we try not to bias ourselves towards one or another metabolite classes using sample preparation. A uh, number of metabolites that can be detected theoretically are more than 1,000, but we, I talk about it more a bit later. 
quantification is usually, usually relative. Uh, throughput is relatively low because there's a lot of uh, things that go through the data analysis and data interpretation, which I will also talk later in my talk. On the other hand, we have another spectra and of the spectra we have targeted. So here sample preparation can be simple or can be complex. It really depends what we want to analyze, what are the levels of metabolites, what are the chemical structures. Canonically speaking, number of metabolites are quite low, could be around 20, not more than 30. But what we want to do is really get absolute quantification. What means absolute quantification? That means that we get a concentration value or we know exactly the amount of molecules that we have in our sample. Uh, throughput depends really on sample preparation. It can be high, can be low. Data analysis interpretation is relatively easy to do. And then we kind of, with targeted profiling, we get the goods from the both worlds. So sample preparation, again, is simple. We don't try to bias ourselves towards uh, some of the metabolic classes. Number of metabolites can be several hundreds. So there are even uh, commercial available kits uh, that can measure up to six uh, or 700 metabolites. Quantification, for most of them, uh, we try to do absolute. But here, the limit is really availability of, of standards. And throughput is relatively high, and data analysis and interpretation is relatively easy to do. Um, OK, so now I'm going to move on to kind of these parts uh, of, of uh, metabolism. I'm going to cover it uh, from sampling to, to, to statistical analysis and, and, and pathway analysis. If there, is there any questions so far? Uh, I don't see a chat, so if, if there's anything in chat, then Laura, please read it out. If not, then I'll just continue. Yeah, my... no questions uh, at the moment. Okay, then I just continue my presentation. So um, about sampling, I will not go too much detail to this, but I just want to use this opportunity to, to highlight the importance of the sampling. So sampling and sample preparation, as in most of the analysis, is the one of the biggest source of errors. Uh, you can have a perfect analytical method, you can have a perfect bioinformatics uh, pipeline, but if your samples are crap, also the results will be crap. Sorry for my language, uh, but this is, this is the truth. Uh, to really ensure good uh, sampling and sample pre uh, preparation procedures, standard operating, operating procedures are really essential. So you need to describe how you're gonna do your sampling and how you're gonna do sample preparation in great details and stick to those soaps. Uh, these pr procedures should not be perfect, but they should be kind of realistic for your lab. For instance, if you collect the blood, in a perfect case, blood should go immediately to the freezer. However, if you don't have a freezer in your lab and you need to walk to your neighbor's lab and it takes, uh, let's say, half an hour, it's fine. But then stick to this protocol for every, every single time you do ex experiments in, in a given study. And one of the reasons why it's so critical is that metabolite levels are affected both by biological and chemical factors. What that means is that the met met metabolism is quite fast and active process. So it needs to be stopped uh, uh, immediately. And the chemical factors are that uh, metabolites are small molecules that are chemically reactive. So they can, even if we stop enzymatic reactions uh, and things like that, there are still chemical reactions happening there. Uh, they can degrade, they can convert one to another. So therefore it's super important to have a good sampling and sample preparation procedures. And of course, we all know that, you know, age, uh, BMI index, things like that affect uh, um, results. But there also there's things like fasting, for instance, and not fasting in, in the sense that, uh, you know, take the blood, for instance, when you without breakfast, but also people who do fasting, for instance, like the Ramadan fasting. In this case, there's a publication from 2014 where people uh, kind of looked at the metabolic profiles uh, of Ramadan fasting. So if there's kind of particular diet that people go through, this will affect metabolite levels. Uh, also, circadian rhythm affects the metabolite levels. Again, this is a study where they looked at, at the metabolite levels of human blood and they observed this kind of um, rhythmic uh, changes in meta uh, metabolite levels, for instance, here with the tryptophan. Uh, it changes according to the daytime. So then again, either you kind of um, stick to one time when you take the blood from patient or, or just be aware that this ha can have an effect on, on your results. Other things like sample type, is it, again, if you talk about uh, human uh, met metabolomic studies, so is it plasma or serum? This will affect metabolite levels and affect the results. So there will be some metabolites that are higher in serum, there will be that are higher in plasma, and reason for that is, of course, there's different sample preparation procedures. 
and, and different times the blood stands on, on the table. So this can, again, affect metabolite levels. So be aware that this might be a confounding factor that you need to, that you need to correct for. Uh, and then sample storage. So how do you store your sample? Is it in dry ice, minus 80, wet ice, room temperature? So this also can change metabolite levels, even when you have prepared seroplasma or have a ready to use extract. And uh, actually yesterday, a colleague of mine sent this picture from, from LinkedIn that someone showed. So what do you do with the uh, uh, samples that are shipped to you without dry ice? For metamorphic studies, you just trash them. There's there's no way how can you use it and get any reasonable results for that. Um, okay, I'm done with uh, with uh, sampling. Is there any questions or are there any questions? Silence. Okay, then I move on with the with the data acquisition. So as this talk is about uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, so I thought that. Um, uh, I need to give a bit of introduction. So what is this technique and how it uses? So for those of, one, you, of you who know LCMS, great. For those of you who don't, uh, I really give kind of five minute crash course in this. So liquid chromatography or high performance liquid chromatography is a separation method that uses both uh, solid phase and liquid phase for chromatography processes. Uh, the benefit for that is that it can analyze a wide variety of compounds with a wide polarity range and wide uh, uh, molecular weights. So there is no really upper limit. So you can analyze really big molecules and even like RNA or DNA fragments or also really small molecules, let's say like short chain fatty acids like acetate and things like that. Uh, so this is really powerful technique to separate compounds to reduce the complexity of the samples before detecting compounds and also to kind of concentrate the samples. On the other hand, mass spectrometry is really powerful technique for detection. So it really allows specific compound identification. So you can look at compound mass, you can do fragmentation and, and look at the structure of compound. It is really sensitive. So modern um, mass spectrometers can go, can go down to femtogram amounts. Uh, and it's really highly selective. So you can really, from the, all the bunch of molecules that you have in your sample, you can really selectively take the ones that you need uh, with accurate mass. Um, so liquid chromatography, it's all about the peaks. This is what all the LCMS and HPLC guys do. They work hours and hours, days and days to optimize the peaks. So here's a brief overview how the H H HPLC works. So all the magic happens in HPLC column. It's basically a steel rod filled with the kind of fine powder that is uh, a stationary phase. And through the stationary phase, we pump the mobile phase which is in most of the cases, organic solvent, could be water solvent with some, some additives. And then you hook up the detector of the outlet. And with this detector, you can monitor everything that comes out from the column. So all the things that are, you know, if you inject the sample, you're gonna monitor it over time and you're gonna record intensity. It can be absorption in case of UV detector, or it can be uh, uh, ion intensity in case of mass spectrometry. And so you can lo load your sample on HPLC column and as the mobile phase flows through, also your sample will start to move on and some of the compounds from the sample will separate from other compounds. However, what happens is during this process of compound moving through the, through the column, it, uh, it will kind of disperse. So it will, there will be kind of dispersion or, or um, a diffusion and you will not have this really nice narrow band of the compound. It will be kind of uh, dispersed or, or diffused in space. And then if it enter, enter, uh, exits the column, what you're gonna record is kind of a peak. In ideal case, this peak should be uh, as a Gaussian shape. And this is what most of the alpha chemists uh, kind of strive for. This is our golden uh, peak. We want a Gaussian distribution. We want it to, uh, that it's retained in the column. And we want that, uh, you know, different compounds are, peaks are separate from one each other. Why we are so obsessed with the peaks is because if we see a peak, it means a compound. So only things that end, uh, exit the column as, as a compound will give peaks and peak areas. So if you cal uh, calculate the area under the curve here, it will correlate to the concentration. So knowing the peak area and having standards, we can calculate the concentration. And additionally, the retention time uh, of this peak, so this is time when peak uh, uh, exits the column, will be specific for the given method. So in, in, there are times when retention time can be used to identify the molecules. So in mass spectrometry, 
uh, we talk, it's all about the masses. So this is kind of simple overview of the mass spectrometer. So what it's, we need to keep in mind that mass spectrometry uh, analyzes ions. So before the compound enters the mass spectrometer, it goes through the ion source and it gets ionized. Then we have a mass analyzer. I will not go in details. There's plenty of mass analyzers that will analyze the mass of the given ion and present as the results as uh, intensity and mass to charge ratio. So mass to charge ratio means it's a mass of, of uh, analyte and a charge. For small molecules, it's usually the charge will be one. So in case of this compound, which is uh, glutamate, we're going to see the mass of 147. What is important when we talk about mass spectrometry and also we can talk about metab metabolomics is mass resolution. So mass resolution is ability to distinguish masses that are slightly different. So and higher resolution means we can, if we have a higher resolution, the ability to separate compounds with similar masses increases and higher accuracy means, uh, higher resolution means we can go get also higher mass, uh, mass accuracy so in simple terms, meaning we get more digits after the comma for the mass value. And to demonstrate that, so I have here two compounds, one is glutamine uh, with a mass of 146.0691 and similar compound adipic acid. There's both are metabolites, both are present in human plasma or cell extracts. It has a different structure. It has a different uh, sum formula uh, compared to glutamine, but the mass is really, really close. So only at the second digit after the comma, uh, there's a difference. So if we have those two compounds in, in, our, in our mix and we we'll analyze them, we need to have mass spectrometer that can distinguish between. And so here is a kind of a simulation of, of different resolution values. So with the resolution value of thousand, if we can analyze these, these compounds, what we only can get the masses is 147. So basically here's theoretical mass. If we will not be able to distinguish these two compounds. Once we start to increase the resolution quite significantly to 24,000, 25,000, these two compounds will start to separate. So, and also please pay attention to the scale, yeah, that here it's from 146 to 148, and here's 147.05 to 140, 147.09. So with this increased resolution, we can kind of start to push those compounds uh, aside and we get more digits of the decoma for the, for the mass. And I will talk about it a bit later, but this is super important for you when identify the metabolites or identify the unknowns. And then if we go even further and we have a, a resolution of 70,000, we can completely separate those compounds with the baseline and we can even further get more accurate mass. And this will also be super beneficial when we try to identify it. So mass resolution really matters when we talk about metabolite analysis and we talk about uh, kind of unknown compound analysis. And then what also uh, clever people have done, uh, they have hooked up two mass spectrometers or two mass analyzers together. So why it's useful is that, you know, we have one mass analyzer, so we have our compound coming in, we get the mass, and then this compound goes through the collision cell. Usually this collision cell is filled with uh, um, inert gas and this molecule will break in, in smaller fragments. And then on second mass analyzer, we can measure the mass of those fragments. And what we get is a fragmentation spectra. And this fragmentation spectra will be specific for the given molecule. So this fragmentation spectra, we can use either to identify compound or to increase selectivity, meaning that we can measure here mass 147 and here mass 130, and there'll be only one or two compounds in the world that will have these kind of combination of the masses. On the other hand, we can use this mass spectra saying, okay, this is, this is mass spectra. It, it usually is called MS2. This is the spectra that comes from this one mass 147, and we can search the databases to identify the compounds. Um, and mass spectrometers these days come in different uh, sizes and shapes. Uh, and besides mass resolution, what is also important is sensitivity and speed, meaning how, how fast it can measure. And here are, I, I put most commonly used mass spectrometers these days that are used for metabolite analysis. So one is Orbitrap mass spectrometer, which has really high mass resolution. So here mass resolution can go up to 1 million, uh, which is not commonly used. Usually people use it around uh, 75,000. Then, and, but it's a relatively slow analyzer, meaning we don't get too many measurements per, per, per time point. And sensitivity is also not the best. Then in the middle, we have a time of flight, 
our TOF instruments. So here, master resolution can be up to 25,000. It's quite sensitive and also it's quite, it's, it's really fast instrument. And then the lower end, we have a quadruple, which is really low resolution instrument. So the resolution is uh, around 1,000. So it gives us plus minus 0 0.7 Dalton measurements, but it is super sensitive and it's super fast instrument. So this one is used really for target metabolomics or for metabolites that we know are really low abundant and we want to boost up the sensitivity. Um, and before I dive into the data processing, so what I will also will briefly talk about or show is kind of what is the what is mass spectrometer data? What is actually LCMS data? What is what is the fabrics that this data is made of? And to do so, to better explain it, so it's easier to do kind of virtual experiment. So let's say we have our mass spectrometer, and we want to scan it from uh, 100 to 110 mass to charge, let's say Daltons. And one, and one scan is one second. So what will happen is that in this one second, mass spectrometer will go through the masses from 100 to 110, and look what are the intensities for each given mass. So it will scan, and let's say nothing is coming out from our uh, chromatogram, the signal is zero, so there's nothing. Next, what we can do is we can sum up these signals, and the sum of all those signals of all individual masses will be called total ion count, or total ion chromatogram and abbreviation is tick. And so we can display it here. When you sum everything up, it's tick. So after this first second of scanning, there will be a second scan. Uh, and here, all of a sudden, we have a count on this mask here. So it'll be recorded, and then everything else is again zero. And so the total ion count will be one. Then on the third second, we do it again. And all of a sudden, we have uh, some signal of the mass 100 and 105. And so the total count kind of increases to eight. And we can repeat this process over and over again till we get the data table. So what we have here on uh, kind of y-axis time, and here we have intensity. So at the end, it's kind of three-dimensional data uh, because here, you know, we have intensity of all those masses. And now this is the data kind of matrix that we can play with, uh, that we can uh, use to to, to analyze metabolites. And this is what's kind of happening in the background of all the things that I'm gonna talk uh, further on in my talk. So now what, what we can do, we can start a plot. So we can take a total ion count and plot it against time. So what's you know, this time? And what will, if it's a chromatogram, if we have a chromatograph peak, it will look something like this. We will get a total ion chromatogram. So next we can say, okay, I have a particular compound of interest, which is 100 or 105. So I take those masses and I take that count counts or intensities for those ions and also plot against time. And what I now get is extracted ion chromatograms. So I get extracted ion chromatogram for mass to charge ratio of 100 and 105. And so to say that these, these chromatograms are kind of hidden behind total ion chromatogram. So when I have this kind of data matrix, I need to go step by step, look at the, uh, all possible uh, masses to get out those peaks to get out those peaks that I can further process. Okay, that was kind of introduction about LCMS and what is actually the, the data behind that. And now I would like to move to data processing and annotations. Are there any questions? If there's none, then I will proceed. So once we have acquired the data using um, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, this data need to be processed and annotated in some cases to really from these, from here that we want to get really metabolites. Uh, these processes will be a bit slightly different for untarget analysis and targeted analysis. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's a kind of differences in approaches how these analysis are done. So to repeat, untarget analysis is really a global comprehensive. So we don't really um, know what we want to see or what we will, what we will, what we will detect. And usually with these kind of results, what we get is a qualitative identification of compounds. We employ databases and libraries to search for those uh, identifications. And at the end of the day, we get relative quantification. So we would compare sample, uh, one sample with other sample and say, okay, in this sample, we have a higher concentration. And this will be report. Um, and what also this untargeted analysis involves is really extensive data processing procedures because we need to search for those peaks, we need to identify those peaks and things like that. 
The drawback of this uh, technique is here relative quantification. If we do relative quantification, we can only compare the samples between samples. So I can compare sample A with sample B. I cannot compare metabolite A with metabolite B. So because the values that we get are not comparable. So if, if, if for metabolite A in my sample uh, intensity is two times higher than in sample one, it's fine. But if metabolite B, it's the same, I cannot compare A and B directly. Also, it's really hard to do a comparison between different experiments as there might be kind of um, differences. On the other end, we have target analysis. So here we really know metabolites that we measure. We have standards, we have both the standards, and we know them. We, we have a method that's optimized to really just analyze those metabolites. Uh, what we get from this is really absolute quantification. So we do a classical uh, calibration curves. We prepare st standards with increased concentrations. We plot them on this is concentration, this is intensity. We get the calibration curve. And then when we analyze unknown compound, we can use this uh, calibration curve equation to get the concentration. Uh, this absolute quantification is really crucial and really important because what it allows us is it allows us to compare metabolites. What I mean by that is if in my target analysis, I see that, uh, for instance, alanine concentration is 50 micromolar uh, and proline is 25, I can say that phenylalanine is two times higher than proline. I can compare the concentrations. Uh, in untargeted, if I see that my uh, signal for uh, phenylalanine is 5,000 and uh, for proline uh, 250,000, I cannot compare those signals directly because I don't know what is concentration. So I can really compare the metabolites, metabolite levels, and I can compare samples. I can compare sample A with sample B. I can do also all, all sorts of things. And also across the experiments, it's really comparable. So if it's really solid, absolute quantification, I can compare results that are obtained uh, from five years uh, to today to in 10 years. The drawback of this is it's really ex extensive hands-on experiments. So we need to prepare the standards, we need to analyze them, and also the data curation and processing is really more hands-on and not so uh, bioinformatics driven. And also because of that, there's a kind of a difference in, in uh, data processing uh, procedures. So in untarget analysis, we have a lot of steps for data pre-processing and data annotation uh, to really identify those metabolites before we can move to the statist statistical analysis. Then in target analysis, we kind of don't have this step. So we can directly, when acquiring the data, we can process the data and then process the data used immediately for statistical analysis. And also data is called that pre-processing as in untargeted, it's really processing. So there is no pre-processing step necessary. So because of that, uh, I briefly want to talk about what is the data processing procedure. So first we need to create a processing method. Uh, processing method basically means we give mass to charge ratio of our metabolite and we give retention time into the software. That software can look for this metabolite. If we have, you know, a high resolution mass spectrometer, we can put really a lot of numbers there and we can do retention time. And okay, this will be kind of identifiers for the software to know where to look for that. Then uh, these peaks will be integrated and there's a lot of kind of manual steps to check this in integration. Then we're gonna check the quantification, meaning calibration curves. And once all, of, all of this is checked, we're gonna get the quantitative values, usually as concentrations, could be micromoles or milligrams per gram, whatever. And we can export it and use it immediately for, uh, for further analysis. All this is usually done in mass spectrometer vendor specific software because this process is really uh, universal for all LCMS analysis. It's not only for metabolomics, it's for pharmaceuticals, it's for drugs, it's for food contaminants, it's for everything that is done with LCMS for quantitative analysis. Uh, for this one, you use a vendor specific software. These softwares, some of them are really easy to use, some are not so easy to use. Most of them you need to pay for them. But if you buy a new mass spectrometer, you will get those softwares. It's just God given. Uh, on the other hand, there are some open access softwares. And one that I want to really highlight here is uh, Skyline. I'm going to talk about a bit later. Uh, the first, just to show the screenshot of uh, vendor specific software. So this is what a typical adult chemist will spend weeks and weeks looking at. So you have the window here where you can see you know, your uh, sample description. Here's all the information about what is the peak height, type, things like that. Here you have your chromatogram. You can check if 
if it's really nicely integrated. And here you have your calibration curve. And all of these things need to be checked manually for every single compound and every single sample that you have correct peak and then the calibration curve looks nice. Uh, Skyline on the other hand is um, maybe a bit clumsier, but where it wins is that it's open access software and it supports all major uh, mass spec vendors. So you can get whatever mass spec data you find and use Skyline to process it. Uh, the interface is quite user friendly. There are really good tutorials um, that you can use and learn, and it's, it's quite easy to understand. And then the basic outline is also the similar to, to vendor specific uh, things. So you have, for instance, your molecules here, you have your chromatogram here, we can also check if integration is correct, and then you can have your peak areas comparison here. Uh, I would suggest for, uh, to use this software if you get some data that is uh, from some kind of repositories. So if you read some paper and they have a date and you want to look at it, you can download this mass data and then use the Skyline to process it so that you don't need TraceFinder or, or, the, or, or mass links or, or mass hunter. Uh, Skyline can handle all the file formats. So this is really good to look in previously published data or if you have kind of really limited uh, mass spectrometry uh, experience, use the tutorials and you will, you will you will get yourself around these data. Okay, uh, and now the, the big kind of heavy part comes, which is on target analysis. So on target analysis, because of its nature, there's a lot of, lot of steps going on into data pre-processing and annotations. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through those steps, explain what is the meaning of it, why to use it, what you wanna get. I will also briefly talk about the statistical analysis and a bit of pathway analysis, but biggest chunk of my last part of presentation will be here. And also at the end, there will be kind of uh, tips from my side, which softwares or, or tools to use. Uh, to start this part, I wanna borrow the quote from one of my previous colleagues, uh, that data processing is not challenging because it is hard to perform, but it is challenging because it's hard to perform well. So pre-processing can be done, but to do it well, you really need to be aware of all the ticks and trips and all about the details that can affect it. So the first step in LCMS data pre-processing is feature detection. What it means is that you have the raw data, so we, which, which I showed you before, this total ion chromatogram, which contains the sum of all the detected ions there. And what you want to do is do the peak picking. So go through this matrix of the sample, get the mass to charge ratio and the retention time for all possible peaks there. Uh, and what you end up is from total ion chromatogram, you will end up with extracted ion chromatograms. So what it means, you get from kind of this picture here, we have like, you already can see some peaks, but some peaks that are really hidden in, in, in the background. To these pictures, I jumped over, sorry, uh, where you see, okay, I, I have one mass, I have extracted this one mass, and I have retention for this one mass. So this is a one peak. And here is another peak, and so on and so forth. And usually these things, when you have a mass to charge ratio and retention time, at this point, they're called features. So they are they not compounds, they're not metabolites. At this stage, they're called features because you don't know from where this mass comes from and you know uh, if, if it's really from your sample or from somewhere else. So this is this moment called features. So you detect all those features. And in typical uh, LCMS experiment, these features are like several thousands, 25,000, 50,000 features are easily detected in any LCMS run. So the next step when you have extracted all those features, this you have this huge list, is to align these features. So what it means is that due to the technical variation, there might be a slight shift or larger shift in retention time. And then you wanna do, you wanna align those features across different samples. So if you have like, here you have three samples and these features are kind of, it's the same features, meaning the mass to charge ratio is the same, but retention time is slightly different then there are, you can set certain, uh, certain criteria. For instance, what should be the, the peak width? What should be the uh, deviation of retention time? It should be like you know 0 0.2 to one minute. And this all boils down to really analytics. So there you will need to know from another person, what is the accepted range of deviation here? And then 
what software does or what you do when you, you code yourself, you would align those so that all the features are aligned uh, for, for all the samples. So did I jump over? No. So once you have those features aligned, what you do next is feature filtering. Feature filtering, there's a lot of different steps involved there. And kind of one is remove contaminants. So for instance, you have really nice feature in all your samples, you see really nice peak, it's really intense. Um, but then you use look at method blank. You know, this is the when you just inject pure solvent. And you see there's also the same feature there. So what it tells you is that it actually doesn't come from your sample, it most probably comes from the blank. It's, it could be contaminant, could be something in, in, in your system that just flushes out. So you would say, okay, this feature, you know, it's I, I need to remove it. I cannot proceed with that. So you remove it. Next would be remove low quality features. And uh, here is something that I, I haven't mentioned so far is you, you would use QC sample. So you would look at the QC samples and see, for instance, you can assume that I want that all these features I use further as I are detected my QC samples, or that variation of these features is quite low, let's say around 30% of my QC samples. And what is usually used as quality control samples, uh, there's two strategies. One is called pooled QC sample. When you take small aliquots from your uh, study samples, put them together, and this is run. This is kind of standard that is used for untargeted. In targeted metabolomics, sometimes people use reference materials. Uh, it's a material where you know the value, you know that concentration you need to hit. And QC samples are usually at least 10% of all samples. So every 10th injection is quality control. So you can assess uh, analytical performance. You can say how your instrument performs. You can do it for batch correction. I'm going to show it later. And also for feature filtering. So here you would use this pooled sample and you say all the features that they use further should be detected in QC sample, and it should be really stable and repeat or, uh, with a good precision and repeatability. And then you would, you know, even further kind of uh, reuse the future uh, feature list from this. And the next step is, uh, or sometimes final step is remove redundant features. So what I mean with that, that not all the features are compounds. Some of the features come from the same compound. So for instance, here you have this mass 147 with this retention time and with the exact retention time we have a different mass here which has a one dalton difference and most probably this one's isotopic peak so this is the, this this is the compound the same compound but just with one c13 isotope so all of us know that isotopes in nature they are there one percent of all c13 atoms uh, or one percent of all carbon atoms are c13 so they will be present you will detect them so therefore you would use this uh, to kind of say, okay, this actually is isotope from, from, from this. And then there's, for instance, a peak with the mass difference of 22. And every mass spectrometrist knows that this comes from a different adduct. You know, you, you have can have adducts or, or ions when proton is attached to the molecule or for instance, here in sodium. So you say, okay, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's comes from the same compound. So I can say, okay, for my further analysis, you know, I would exclude these features because anyways, it just comes from here. And I use would, I, you would, I would use this one then further for the processing. However, what I need to mention here is that these features can be used for identification. So they can be used to say, okay, you know, I can call them, what is the, my C13 intensity, and this can help me for identification of compounds and so on and so forth. So when I have all my uh, features now, I can normalize them or I should normalize them. And usually normalization is you could adjust the signal to reference, reference value. For instance, in a case of uh, cell metabolomics, you could uh, analyze the cell count or the protein content. Uh, you could analyze to the total iron count to kind of uh, adjust for different values. You could normalize it to, to kind of reference value that, that influences your, your intensity of, of detected features. Uh, once you have this, if your uh, sample is run across several batches or even across one batch, uh, what you should consider as batch corrections. Uh, so here I took a, a picture from, from this publication here, which is also in literature that you're going to find in this uh, OneDrive folder I showed in the beginning. So what people have done here is you have a quality control sample and you have a quite long run with 70 samples. And they map how this quality control sample performs over this long run. 
and you could say, okay, there are kind of fluctuations from the instrument and I want to normalize them out. So I would bring then all the quality controls in the same line, you know, use a kind of di differentiation. And then all the samples that are around that, I would use this correction coefficient to correct for that. To kind of adjust for, uh, for these fluctuations that happen just naturally from, from instrument. This is usually done with when, when it's run without LC, just MS analysis. And if the series is longer than a couple of hundred samples. There are a group in, in ETH Zurich that runs uh, just flow injection mass spectrometry. They run several hundreds of samples a day, and they use this approach to kind of normalize uh, for the fact that the instrument over time gets dirty and for, for these kind of differentiations. Then if you, so this is the typo, so this would be num number two. Uh, then you can use this Q QC values to, to the adjust the inter-batch fluctuations. So you have one sample batch you run uh, in, in one day, and then you have another day. And if you have the same QC sample and you measure it, then you can use the QC values to normalize the batch differences. And again, this is really useful for larger studies. Uh, usually it's not so critical for targeted anal analysis because it will be absolute quantitative, but it's really critical for untargeted analysis where these signals will be influenced by, by instrument performance. Uh, what I also want to uh, point out here is that, uh, so I, I talked about uh, data processing and I'm going to move on to annotation. Uh, what is also possible is, so once you have those features to first do statistics with the features and only then on annotation. So to swap these steps, uh, but with most of the studies I have seen that they process the data, do the annotation, then statistical analysis, it's possible to other, other way around. Uh, the benefit there is that you get less features that you should annotate. And I'm going to show it what annotation means. So basically annotation is you move from features to metabolites. You have your mass to charge ratio, you have your attention time, and you want to show, you know, that this is actually glutamine that I'm, I've been measuring there. So you would end up with feature table that you want to transfer to metabolites. Uh, so we really want to assign the molecular information to the features. This information that we can assign really depends on the data that we get. It could be, you know, just a contributing atoms, some formula, structure class, maybe atomic connection. Maybe it's, uh, is it, is it phenylalanine or not? Relative uh, st stereochemistry, leucine or isoleucine. And in best case, also uh, chirality. So is it D or L amino acid? But this really depends on, on, on our analytical performance. For annotations, usually what people use is a spectral databases, and they are really fundamental to the metabolomics. There are lots of databases available there, both theoretical and uh, experimental, that allows to search for them using the, uh, using these sort of information to identify metabolites, to identify those features. So the move from features to metabolites. So um, uh, there are. Metlin is really nice to use. Uh, there is human metabolic database, which is quite easy and nice to use. And these are the ones that also can be implemented in, in separate scripts like R and Python. So to illustrate actually what annotation means and why, uh, why the analytical info information matters, um, I kind of want to do a case study or sort of say virtual case study. So let's say we have, we have this feature with this mask here. And uh, I used human metabolite database. Here is the LCMS search, where you can search for uh, corresponding metabolites. So you can enter here the mass. I put here is the mass that we detected. And for instance, if I don't know which is the adduct, I don't know if it's a uh, sodium or if it's uh, you know um, ammonia adduct. I put unknown. And let's assume I have a low mass resolution instrument, so I can only measure this mass with uh, with 0 0.05 plus minus. So what will this metabolite database give me will be 333 metabolites. So this information is not enough for me to really pinpoint one metabolite. So there's a plethora of possibilities here, even with this mass, even with this kind of low mass tolerance, it still will give me uh, hundreds of results. So next, uh, let's say in our case, we have high resolution mass spectrometry, so I can narrow this mass tolerance to 0 0.05 and do the search again. So in this case, I get 70 metabolites. Still number is quite high. I mean, you can start to do some here, some uh, well-educated guessing and kick some metabolites out, but it's in this case, it's quite speculative still. 
So let's say I have more information. You now what I talked about this feature filtering um, that you know I can identify. Okay, I have this um, a proton here on my ion. This is the mass, and I still have this high resolution instrument. So what I end up is eight metabolites. So this is also something that I can handle. It. The next step that I can even more narrow it down is so-called MS2 search. So I showed you about this uh, time the mass spectrometer. When you have uh, one molecule, you can fragment it and get, get some fragments, right? And then you can use this fragment spectra, which is shown here. I took it also from database. You can use the spectra for the search. So once, if I have this information, if I have done it, if I have acquired this, I can use it to annotate and identify metabolites. So here in the same, uh, in same database, I got LCM SMS search. I put in here uh, the name, or sorry, the, the mass, the charge and intensities. I put here, what is the precursor, where it comes from and what is the tolerance. And from this search, I get three metabolites. And if I look at them, so here will be my metabolites, right? One will be the one that is actually, I'm searching for glutamic acid. There's be some more, but there's also a fit score. So the higher the fit or false discovery rate score, the higher probability. So from this search, I can start to say, okay, I, I know, you know, I have my mass, I have MS2 spectra, and I identify that this metabolite that I found in my data set that may be exchanged is really glutamic acid. And really the annotation is numbers game. So this is the, just uh, as for illustrative purposes, I used also the paper from the group that I know uh, where they did untarget metabolomics on cell lines. And you can see here, they see it, when they move from features to metabolites, the numbers drastically decrease. You know, they identified 54,000 features in the data set. So they acquired and target data and they could find 54,000 peaks. But once they do all the processing and all the identification, they reliably can identify only 200 metabolites in this given method. So it's super important for all the studies to keep in mind that, you know, that not mass to charge ratio doesn't grant you the right to call it a metabolite. And this also should be considered, it must be considered when reporting. There are several guidelines out there, and this is one from a really prominent group in papers also in, in, in the in, uh, in the folder that gives guidelines how you should annotate the structures that you publish based on the, on, on, on the information that your mass spectrometer or your analytical chemist gives you. You know, if, if, if it's only based on mass to charge, you know, this is not enough. You know, you, you need to kind of identify at least structural classes. Uh, if, you, if you know your formula, then you need to uh, give the formula. Or, uh, you know, if you have a name, you need to identify how this name was uh, identified. And, and only, you know, if you can really have capabilities to say, is it L or D uh, amino acid, then you can only write L isolacine, you know. If you don't have it just called isolacine, don't, don't uh, exaggerate. So, and this is even more critical in, in, in uh, lipidomics. So when you measure lipids, there are tons of uh, databases and softwares out, you know, they would just spit out some, some lipid because this is entry there, you know, they say, okay, this lipid, uh, has this mass, therefore it's this, which with the, with the given instrument, you cannot assess, let's say the double bond position or your fatty acid position. So you need to really back down a bit and say, okay, you know, maybe I just give the sum formula. I don't, I don't really give the structural information because I cannot assess with my analytics. So my advice here is, you know, do not publish everything the database spits out. Really take it with a grain of salt and really critically look what is possible. And then here also this identification level is proposed here. So level A, the highest level, you should have a standard, you should have an or NMR confirmation of that. B2 is that you have fragments, you have certain fragments and database says, yes, it's correct. Uh, then, you know, if it's MS only, if you only measure the mass, it's the lowest in the identification level. And there are guidelines that suggest how you should, how you should report it. Okay, now a bit about statistics. Uh, so, you know, I have my samples, I have groups, I have metabolites, I have this uh, list of, of, of values. What will happen more often is that, you know, there will be empty, there will be missing values. There will be nothing there. And, you know, you cannot work with empty values. So what you need to do is treat those values and treating is called imputation. So you use information that is available from the existing data 
to generate those values. Um, and there are several reasons why data is missing. You know, it's really maybe not there in a compound. Uh, maybe it's not detected. Maybe there was something wrong with, uh, with your data processing. There can be lots of different reasons, but you need to impute those values and generate. Um, and these missing values is, is a problem on every single metabolomics data set. And here's kind of a, uh, from this publication here, a table I took that shows, you know, that you have, these are the number of metabolic features detected. Uh, and this is the number of missing values per data set. And this is number of missing uh, molecule features with the value or molecule features with the missing values. So missing values are several thousands usually in data set. And there are up to 10 to 15% of the features have missing values. So this data imputation is really important topic and something that should really be considered in a great detail when dealing with uh, metabolomics data processing before statistical analysis. And thankfully there are people that are much smarter than me who have really looked into that. And there are a lot of different methods available and they have evaluated, for instance, here's a paper from 2019 when author says, you know, random forest based imputation is the best one for LCMS. So if you want to do it, just go there, read the paper and use it. Uh, kind of practical advice, the worst case scenario, if you don't know, if you have zero background in bioinformatics, if you don't know what to do, you get this table from some colleague, you have those missing values, what to do then is then either ask them for limit of detection and, uh, you know, kind of um, replace missing values with half of limit of detection or uh, replace the values with one third of the smallest reported value. Look with the smallest reported value and then just take one third of, and replace all the missing values. It's better than having uh, empty, empty cells there. A uh, bit briefly talking about statistics. Uh, so statistics, you know, it's we want to get from uh, metabolite features to really see if there's a kind of variables uh, based on kind of clinical interest. So simply uh, speaking, we want to get, you know, this data table in nice graphs with maybe some stars, you know, bar plots, volcano plots, PCR, something like that. Statistics, generally speaking, uh, is not different from any other data, type, uh, data types. So it's business as usual. It's univariate analysis, correla correlation analysis, chemoinformatics, multivariate analysis. So lots of tools that you have already used maybe for genomics analysis, for other types. You, st you still can use, or you will use the same things. There are a plethora of open source implementations. There are a lot of packages for R and Python that you can use. So it's statistics is the same as, as you have seen before and, and everything have done. What is a bit different is um, a pathway network analysis. Here it gets a lot complicated because, you know, these metabolomics kind of really are accompanied by enzymes and transporters and they were really is, is a system that weaves one into each other. And, and there are several public databases like CAG and MetaSci, where you can do the pathway analysis, look at that. And methods that are used are usually overrepresentation analysis, enrichment score, functional class scoring, things like that. But what is really uh, important here that I want to highlight is you need to know a priori metabolite identification. So before you do pathway network analysis, you need to know what are the metabolites, uh, because you know with just multiple features, you will not be able to do that. Okay, um, and to finish my talk, so the question is, okay, everything looks cool and all, but how can I do it? You know, if I have this data in my hand, how can I do it? And if I would need to give one word answer, it will be metabolanalyst. This is, you know, the best thing I have discovered while working with metabol metabol metabolomics. It's a cloud-based application that is like all in one tool to really explore metabolomics data. So this is the landing page that you will end up when you go to MetaboAnalyst. It can do raw spectra interpretation. It can work with MS Peaks. It can work with annotated features with some generic format. It can do spectra processing, statistical analysis, a pathway analysis, biomarker analysis. So there's lots of lots of difference in there. If you have zero background in bioinformatics, if you don't know how to program, if you're the same as me, go there. This is really great tool. There's also lots of uh, kind of uh, example data that you or, or data that they provide that you can submit and just use to explore the tool. It's really user friendly to do. You know, you can do on target analysis. You can upload the role files there. It will do the P align, uh, peak alignment, peak picking. It will give you the box plots of identified features. It will show you 
comes to look. Uh, it can perform statistics, you know, PCA, uh, ANOVA, T-test. Uh, here I just put, you know, heat maps, uh, PCA scores. It can do path and network analysis. Uh, it's, it's really a, a great tool to explore uh, metabolomics data if you don't have any in-depth knowledge or, or experience with metabolomics data. Uh, other tools that I really want to highlight is XMS Online. Again, it's cloud-based platform. It is really the user-friendly interface for raw mass spectrometry data processing. It can also do statistics. It can also do directly the pathway analysis from these raw mass spectrometry data. Um, it's also quite user-friendly and, and great tool to do the, do the things. So in general, I would you know, suggest if you use this open source uh, or open access platforms to use several of them. Uh, if you if you wanna if you wanna uh, explore your data because there are some features that are complementary from one to another. When we talk about the database, really a great tool to, to look at is the human metabolome database, as I showed you before for annotation. There you can do a lot of searches. Um, if you look at different metabolite entries, it will give all the information metabolite, it gives reference, literature references, things like that. It's really super easy and nice to use. For lipids, there's lipid maps database, which is just focusing on lipids. So here also, it's a, it's a really great tool. Uh, if you are more advanced uh, and better than I am, then you can use programming. If you know R or you know Python, there are tons of papers out there. So again, here, I just pulled one that I know is an IMET. It's a, a pipeline processing chromatopic mass spectrum data for yourself. Uh, you know, they here you can use this uh, software or script to really do all the things for deconvolating data procession, missing value treatment, uh, feature filtering, annotation. Uh, it can also do statistics. You can expand it. Uh, the code is uh, freely available in GitHub, so you can go there and, and download and use it. So if you are proficient with R and Python, there are plenty of options that, that, that you can use. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, I would like